giorni qua non ci deve essere più niente, bisogna cominciare subito. Coraggio, al lavoro, buttate giù. Dico bene, autore? Sì, grazie. Arrivederci, ragazzi. Ci vediamo in un prossimo video. Lo speriamo. Welcome to Cinema Italia, a podcast dedicated to the world of Italian cinema. Presented by me, John Bleasdale. everybody and welcome to writers on oh no wrong one (laughs) (laughs) hello everybody and welcome to cinema italia a podcast which is reveling and celebrating in everything all'italiano cinema all'italiano or cinema all'italiano to give it the correct pronunciation and today i'm delighted to be joined by film critic and writer joanne titmarsh and also You have lived in Italy for how long, Joanne? Uh, I've lived in Italy now for 32 years. Wow, wow. So that's yeah. a, so so you an expert on cinema, but you're also an expert sort of on Italy. On Venice. I wouldn't say on Italy. I'm like the cooking here uh, is very regional and so I'm just an expert on Venice. Yeah. And that's kind of informed your choice of film as well because Signore and Signori and the British English title of this which kind of for once the actual translated title English title is almost better than the original is ladies and no no it's birds and bees and italians yeah <laughs> which is i think is a wonderful uh, title in fact when i looked up pietro germi on google i saw this film with this really weird title and i thought what the hell is that god it's one i've missed i must go back and have a look only to discover it was the film that we were talking about today. Exactly. Signore, signore, which is uh, trans- w- would have translated literally as ladies and gentlemen. Which is a great title. Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, and it's perfect for the film and it's perfect for the characters, the irony of ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely. And the sort of class associations and the yeah. uh, what you were mentioning earlier, you're an expert. Or, I mean, expert, I'm using a very loaded term there, but you're, you you know very well this region, Venice and the Veneto, which is a surrounding region. And this is a film which is, is based here. Yeah, it's actually kind of quite close to your neck of the woods because it's 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 set in an anonymous city, which is very obviously Treviso, which is this very wealthy, conservative city on the mainland, not very far from Venice. Uh, two very different cities, despite being very close to each other. It's quite interesting. It's funny because it's sort of like half halfway between me and you. It's, it's where I get off the top. Yeah, it's where we could meet if we had to have some kind of, you know, if, if we were at war and there was a truce between us. It's our Switzerland. That would be where we would meet to sign some kind of armistice. Or something. Well, what attracted you to this film? I've, I'd never seen it before. It was my first watch. So so thanks for that because it was a, I really enjoyed it. It's a bit of an eye opener, isn't it? Oh, wow. It's so good. It's so yeah. good. Um, what, what? When did you come across this? I came across it, I think, maybe I saw it even on television. Mm. I just think I caught it on Italian TV and saw that it was set sort of fairly locally. So I, I really came across it by chance. And I saw it a really long time ago and I hadn't seen it since. And I have to say, I was quite shocked going back to it. Um, and it did make me also go back and look at other Pietro Germi films. And I've got to say, I kind of have fallen in love with him. I, I didn't really know him all that well. Obviously, Divorzio all'Italiana, uh, which is such a great film. Uh, I think that was really one of the only films and this one that I knew reasonably well. And I knew a very little bit about him, but not very much. And so it has been a real sort of revelation going back to it. I certainly didn't remember the violence of this film. It's 
so slappy. Yeah, I was, it's it's kind of Punch and Judy violence. Yeah, which is really shocking, actually. We're not really used to that anymore. And, and it was just seen as very normal. All these people getting slapped all the time, a husband slapping wives and wives slapping husbands constantly throughout this film. It's so aggressive and nasty. There's an absolute sort of smackdown fight between a husband and wife right at the very beginning, just to to um, to make you to, uh, to to get you into the universe and to know where you're where you stand. No, I, I must admit, this guy is Pietro Gelmi is a blind spot for me. I've just had a look at him on. I mean, I don't think I've seen. I've even seen. Uh, Dvorcio alla Italiana. Uh, what? How's it called in in English? I, I don't know. Divorce, Divorce Italian, Italian style? style. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So I haven't even seen that or Seduced and Abandoned, which is his other. Yeah, they they kind of form a, a trilogy mm. with this film, all about this sort of bourgeoisie society and the hypocrisy of that bourgeoisie society in Italy at the time, because they're all set around the same period in the early 60s. And I think in that period, it's kind of hard not to be a hypocrite almost for a lot of people in Italy um, with the weird sort of medieval laws that were still in force and the power of the church uh, that's in force that comes across quite a lot in all of these films. You know, it's like, don't, you can do what you want, but don't get caught and, and do it quietly and just don't tell anybody. And, okay. and everybody knows, but it's an open secret. It's, it's, in, it's just makes you crazy. And one of the characters does actually <laughs> in this film does begin to lose his mind. And there's this brilliant scene in the town square where he's had enough and he's standing on this tower and he just thinks I can't go on, and and that is just such a great scene for me. I, and I love the capping joke is that his wife bursts through the crowd and says, "Oh, don't do it!" And that's the bit where he goes, "Oh, right now I'm dead." Exactly, <laughs> you can come back to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh no, 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 no! A, a fate worse than <laughs> so death. Good. Just to give everybody, if you haven't uh, seen this film, a sort of well, what's the 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 story, or um, or I suppose uh, I should say the stories. Yeah, there are a lot of stories and it seems very complicated and it does seem like a sort of classic farce where you've got the uh, you've got a group of friends and uh, the main, let's say, one of the main characters, Tony, uh, he decides that he really fancies the wife of uh, his friend who's a doctor. So he says to his friend, oh, I've got this terrible problem, I'm impotent, it's such a disaster, I'm so depressed. And his friend, who you think would have a, a bit of a bedside manner uh, and be a bit tactful, laughs his head off, tells everybody about the, his friend's impotence at a party, <laughs> and then lets his friend go home with his wife, thinking, eh, he can't get it up, she'll be fine. And his wife is this absolutely gorgeous blonde, ditzy blonde bombshell who Tony then seduces and gets caught quite literally with his pants down. And, and that's just the kind of, that's just the beginning of one of many outrageous sort of events that happen. So there are, there are a lot of um, infidelities. There are a lot of... Um, but there's also a real love story. I mean, to just help maybe with the with the sort of the, the plot, there are sort of three main sections. So it's like a kind of pulp yeah, manto film. It's very much a three act. Film. And so you so it's the same group of friends and it's the same place and the same setting, and the stories to some degree interconnect, but they're yeah. sort of like three quite distinct things. As the one you've just described, um, I mean, that is like sort of party scene where you get to know you know you you spend the entire evening from them getting together to them arriving at a party to them going to another nightclub and then this uh sort of the nightclub is just yeah. it's just superb and and it's like watching something out of fellini but fellini who's really he's really got stinko 
you know, he's he's just he's not he yeah. doesn't care about making art. He just wants to have a fun. Well, it's really interesting that you say that because Fellini uh, called uh, Pietro Germi uh, il grande falegname of Italian cinema, and he so he saw him a falegname as a carpenter, and he really saw him as this like master craftsman. And I when I heard that, I thought eh, it's kind of interesting that Fellini would call him a craftsman, which could be seen as disparaging mm. in some way because, you know, Fellini is obviously the artist and then you have the artisan, you know, which might seem like a lesser kind of person. But it's actually Jeremy who called himself an artisan. So Fellini was really just saying, yeah, you know, you are a real master craftsman. And they worked together mm. um, a few times. Oh, so well. Fellini and Jeremy go way back. To, oh, they collaborate? Yeah, they collaborated. Uh, Fellini co-wrote a couple of his screenplays, of Jeremy's screenplays. Um, I can't remember which ones. I think In Nome della Legge, which you would absolutely love and could have been a, one of my choices because In Nome della Legge is a very early film of Jeremy's from 1949. So it's around the same sort of time as uh, The Bicycle Thieves and... It, it is. It has got some. Definitely got touches of neorealism to it. But it is. It is quite literally a spaghetti western because it's just like a western, but it's set in Sicily. And Bellini co-wrote that and something else that I can't remember. So, so they really admired each other and knew each other's work really well. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's it's and it's so funny because you you say about the 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 craftsman and the. Fellini's praise, but this film won the Palme d'Or. Yeah, yeah, not bad for a carpenter. And it's and it's um and it is a full on sex comedy. There's no sort of pretentiousness to it, or you know, it's not it's it, it's it's really loud and in your face, and it's broad characterizations and those crowd scenes I, it's really interesting you brought that up about the craftsmanship because of those crowd scenes where you've got how many characters like eight or nine speaking named roles it's like four, three or four couples and a, a couple of uh bachelors who turn up but you know exactly who everybody is within the space of a minute you know who the boring guy is who everybody avoids yeah, that's so funny oh no it's Scarabo. <laughs> don't talk to and when you hear him talk, you understand immediately. Oh no! Actually, you'll find that the central, the the center left think this, and the center right, and he's like, "I'll oh, run away." And he's such a terrible character that when they arrive at this soiree, the host sees him and says, "That's it! I don't want to have this party." It's goes all... to bed. <laughs> the host <laughs> goes to bed and just leaves them. Oh, it's, it's genius. It's so funny. Yeah, it's funny, but it's absolutely scathing as well. I want to circle back a little bit to just that the to sort of knockdown fight because I think when you know you you highlighted this flagged this up earlier and uh, you flagged this up before I even saw the film you sort of said oh it's more violent than I remember John it reminded me a little bit of Father Ted do you remember the couple who are always fighting with each other uh -huh. and then when the priest turns up it's like oh hello Father and they're the picture <laughs> yeah. of the perfect. Uh, it, it really reminded me of that, that they're so violent with each other they're basically dragging each other around by the hair it's it's incredible and i was amazed at that and i was amazed at how loud it was i had no recollection of how shouty it was but but beneath all of that shoutiness you do get this other sense of uh of all of the machinations you know they're all shouting but everyone the the, there's a woman uh, who is called Ippolita, who it, it's, it's no coincidence that she's named after like the queen of the Amazons, you know, <laughs> she's like, the, she is the queen of that set. And she's married to Tony, this awful kind of philandra, but, and she controls everybody. And she controls not just all of the men and women in their social circle and she, but she controls the churchmen of the town and to an extent the the people in the bank she controls everything it's it's amazing and, and what she is prepared to do to save face i don't think we want to give away too many spoilers it's pretty shocking yeah that that 
scene knocked me knocked me out in the sense that I was like, whoa, I was not expecting it to go in that direction. Right? It is. It's a real shocker. But okay, um, you mentioned something earlier as well, which I want to come well as we go through the through the film. So there's this first film of sort of infidelity, and it could be something from the Decameron. You know, it could be one of those little short stories of how a monk got into a nunnery sort of uh, short story, and and it's very ribald, and it's very you know, and it ends with them sort of singing opera and freeze framing, which is also kind of like wait a minute, this is, they're singing Puccini and it's, the music is with them. And it, and I said earlier on, it's not particularly, it's not arty or pretentious. It's in your face and blah, blah, blah. But it, it's, that's not to say it isn't radical and daring. It's doing really interesting stuff as well from a sort of cinematic point of view. And in every way, like the writing, the names of the characters, you know, the, the priest that's called Dom Schiavon, which is a really common name in the Veneto, but it does also mean slave. He is enslaved to Hippolyta and to all of her, the members of her social group who obviously feed the church. Yeah, because she's sort of on all the committees and doing all the, 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 the you know, the fundraising and what have you. Exactly. And has this, you know, the eye towards the reputation. So they have to count out to, to Hippolyta. Always, everybody has to. It's so good, and yet she has a she has a husband who is who is is everybody knows is the Dan Don Juan of the or the Don Giovanni I should say of the piece, <laughs> and she is completely that's fine as long as it's not public, as long as it's not. And then we move on to the the other story, which is the the, the love story, which is the man who works in the bank, um, and it is the Catholic bank of the Koliugani, the Uganian hills. Um, so um, this is kind of crucial. Osvaldo, poor Osvaldo, who's married to the worst harpy. I'm, I'm going to let you describe this bit. I'm not going to say anything at this point. <laughs> she's so horrible. Gilda, she's Gilda. She, I, I've got to say as well, before we move on, I mean, they're all fantastic performers and Nora Ricci is Gilda as this, this just this awful, nagging wife um, that just browbeats her husband at every opportunity. But Osvaldo falls in love with this very, very uh, sweet girl, um, who works in his in a, in a local cafe, and so that's kind of the second act is all about his affair and their falling in love, and and at a certain point, his harridan wife uh, says, "Oh, you know, like you can leave and get out, and you're no good," and and he just thinks, "Oh God, of course, I can just go. I just I can be free." And so the rest of the, this act is all about him searching for freedom and happiness and, and love and finding love with a decent woman and just moving on. And he is opposed at every step. And it was interesting to think about the, the period. You know, we have the Carabinieri, the police that come uh, and arrest men in this sort of seedy hotel because adultery was still a crime uh, during that period in the 60s and so he you know you could be fined or go to prison for adultery in Italy and they do everything to him you know they threaten the loss of his job and they and she because gets it's a Catholic fired bank. sorry it's a Catholic bank of course and so you know it, all of these parts of society, they're all interlinked. And all of these different people, the bank, the church, and his group of friends do everything to stop him from pursuing what would probably be a really nice life. And instead, he has to go back to jail there. And, and so that thus ends the second act of this film and it's all looking a little bit darker now you know funny as it is and then we go on to the third act which is just awful here we see all of the group of men in action going after a, it starts with the guy that owns a shoe shop the friend that owns the shoe shop 
he seduces a girl who's this kind of country bumpkin. She never really speaks. I don't think she ever speaks. And she's always eating. She's like this sort of ruminant. You know? She's like this sort of bovine creature, very beautiful, kind of just like this little rustic girl in town, probably on market day or whatever. And she goes from man to man because they call each other and they go on a very intricate uh, sort of race around town to move her from one friend to the other from the shoe shop owner to the doctor to, you know, I can't remember what the other men do. And then it transpires that she's 16 and then they know that they're in trouble. And so this is where Hippolyta has her moment (laughs) to rescue the men and to rescue all of their reputations, this kind of collective reputation that they have. And, and that is a pretty shocking story. And, and Jeremy, I have to say, has this obsession, this male obsession with beautiful, virginal, uh, or at least very young, nubile girls. It's kind of a thread, a very nasty thread that runs through his sort of tapestry of films because in... Um, in Nome della Legge, there's a 16-year-old girl that a man uh, wants to marry and he kind of ruins her relationship with her partner. Um, in Sedotte e Abbandonate, again, you know, it's a 16-year-old girl with a ruined reputation. And, and so Jeremy... I think he really likes women. He was brought up in a household of women. His dad died when he was very young. So I think he he does seem to be kind of a champion of women. And he does really look at this male gaze and is sort of horrified, but acknowledges always that it's there and ever present in all parts of society. Because if you go through his films, you know, it can be the middle class man, it can be the kind of mafia guy, but it's a constant. And so it's interesting, I think, his his view of, of what men are prepared to do to get the 16 year old girl. And yet, it, and it is really interesting how i mean that thing about the male gaze is it's kind of quite literally he uses like keyholes uh yeah. in the like they're peering through and there's a lots of closing doors and turning signs around to say back in a minute and things like that and and so you know full well what is happening there's very this is a film full of single entendres but what i found interesting as well is that this girl who you yeah, had the wonderful description you just gave us a ruminant she's kind of like this lolita character but there's no she's not like an innocent necessarily who's been i mean there, there is a fear it's put it this way it's not like a patronizing view of her you know i think there's there's a feeling that she knows what she's doing in a way that she's going from these and she's getting something back she's yeah she's got a pair of gold shoes from first guy you know and she's constantly got something to eat she goes out for a nice dinner and yeah she's aware that she's there's an exchange yeah yeah and like when they find her later sort of she i mean she's seen again later on in the sort on, on the farm she's there like with a big uh, insecticide thing on her back, pumping it against her. And it's like, oh, I can see why she wanted to go to town and, you know, get yeah, and have a good time and be, you know, be treated like a woman. And at, at no point, uh, you know, it should, it should be stated that at no point does she seem to perceive herself as a victim. Um, not not that, that, that doesn't mean that she isn't, but she certainly doesn't feel like she's victimized. Um, And, you know, she grew up on a farm in real poverty and isn't treated all that brilliantly. And she probably thought, kind of nice. That that what you're saying as well about the the sort of satirical intent of this episode, I think is brilliantly illustrated when the uh, journalist is sort of partly ends up narrating the end of the story, if you like. And, and for the brilliantly titled newspaper, The Independent, because he's anything but. And he's preparing this 
finally justice is good you know justice is the same yes, for everybody for these, for these six men or however it is yeah finally the law is going to do what it has to do and then he gets a series of phone calls which tells him oh of course yeah i'm going to take that name out and yes yeah, no, redact no. redact redact <laughs> until until there's it, there's nothing left of the story essentially and then and the irony is that then the the farmer and gets into trouble for spreading falsehoods about these poor men the, you know, oh, how dare you say that stuff about Kevin Spacey? You've ruined his career. Yeah, and and they find themselves on the on the harsh end of the law then, and and also the media because that that story will be published. So, um, I think that I think that Jeremy really is someone who, despite winning at Cannes and despite getting an Oscar for um, Divorce Italiana and so on, I kind of feel like Jeremy's been a bit forgotten and a bit sidelined and and that is one of the reasons that i chose the film uh a because it's set local to us and i thought that period in particular like the 1950s or even from the 40s up to the 60s we often think of rome and Cinecittà as the kind of epicenter of of italian filmmaking but but Jeremy, who is from Genoa originally, um, he he kind of took Italians on a bit of a road trip and 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 took a lot of film out of Rome. Uh, he focused on Sicily a lot and made, I think, five films in Sicily, which is really interesting. And I I kind of like the non rome centric uh the regionality of jeremy uh, which isn't to say that he didn't kind of have films that he made in rome as well he's got um... i think he's kind of a fascinating filmmaker and definitely someone that if you don't know as a, as a director he's absolutely worth watching and he was a little bit sidelined in italy because of the times because i think the fact in the 60s that period of kind of social upheaval here he he was seen to be a little bit middle of the road like this kind of christian democrat type person and and wasn't far left enough he likes kind of law and order a little bit too much and so i think he didn't really get the praise that he deserved maybe for political reasons but he's a great filmmaker do you think you can see that a little bit in the film as well in that um there is a satire there is it, it certainly takes no prisoners in terms of showing hypocrisy yeah he's really brave actually i don't know many filmmakers that that would that damning of italian society and saying like look at your you know you look at your stupid laws look at how you behave and using treviso which is one of the wealthiest cities in Italy, uh, basing his film there to say, like, look at these people, they're, they're disgusting. And I don't know, I feel it was, I think it's pretty brave. I didn't find the people as disgusting. I found them, I, I thought there was an anarchy to their lives and a, a libido to their lives, which was bouncing against the hard edges of structures that they were living under you know so they're all calling each other by these honorifics it's all ingegnere avocato consigliere commandatore you know, professore you don't even call the doctor doctor he's professore to show an even higher thing and the professore is the guy who's who just is screaming with laughter at his patients, but it's screaming with laughter. He's so, you know, he's like, a, you know, he fills, I, I'm, you know, who would be like a Rodney Dangerfield character or something. He's, he's just absolutely, uh, or Zero Mostel in the, in the producers. He's just so over the top. And you do, I, I think there is an element of kind of affection for some of these people yes certainly some of them are but it, but i'll give you an example of what i mean is when they think they're they're going to jail they're constantly joking with each other really cruel jokes and really but yeah they, they do have a great banter they're, there's i mean it's brilliantly written you, you you completely believe all of them 
when when a shoe lands in the middle because they're one of their you know they're, they're 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 bantering in the square and they're having this they've got their table and they joke and they observe people and they gossip and a shoe lands and one of them turns around and says oh that's taking a joke too far and i just thought that moment is really excellent because it's like these guys don't know any limits at all yeah they have no parameters the the uh, the anonymous letters there's lo- there are loads of anonymous letters. It's a bit of a sort of an Oscar Wilde kind of uh, uh, what's the word? sort of theme that runs through this. They they write each other anonymous letters like at, at a party. Onto their wives as well. <laughs> oh yeah, at the party. Yeah, I forgot about that. But somebody even dobs him into his wife. Hmm, who could it be? And uh, oh my god, yeah. And, and anonymous letters appear in another film of Jeremy's as well. I think in Divorzio Italiana, they're anonymous letters. So it's something that he kind of likes putting in. There's a brilliant bit where Osvaldo has received the letter and he sort of, he's so, he's so scared to open it that he just opens it a little bit and he sees it's written, it's signed. By like a, a friend. <laughs> it's like, oh no, I know it's going to be terrible. Now yeah, yeah. It's beautiful in its, in its awfulness. Yeah, and there, and there is a great um, there's a great moment in, in the film when uh, right in the beginning in the first act when Tony is caught with his uh, braces hang dangling out of his trousers, <laughs> and the doctor uh, says to him they're having a big fight and everyone's getting slapped as usual and someone and then Scarabella rings the doorbell and they stop fighting and they go who's that and and the doctor says to Tony, che resti fra noi, like this stays between us. And that's kind of the mantra of the film. It's like we can behave, we can, you know, we can be fighting and rolling around on the floor and fucking each other's wives and we can be doing all kinds of things, but it stays in our circle. And it's almost like he's addressing the menage a trois right there. It's his wife and Tony, and it's just like, this is okay, this to be continued, you know, in more ways than one. Because you don't think Tony and Naomi are going to give up on this either. This is just going to be a continuing thing for the rest of the time. But here's a question. I mean, um, one of the things I wondered about is this is very much a sex comedy, and uh, and and there are sex comedies that you know Marcello Mastroianni we've already looked at um the the priest's wife in an o- earlier episode and obviously he's worked with Jeremy as well which is another veneto based film yeah Dino Risi made lots of films uh set in Venice and in the Veneto yeah yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, and we should also say that because, you know, for English, uh, people who are uh, English language speaking and they're, they're watching these uh, and they don't know Italian particularly well, it's re- it, it's not only that people have different accents in different regions, they also speak different dialects. So uh, a lot of the time there will be certain turns of phrases and certain ways of talking, which will ver- be very, very uh, obvious as soon as you... Yeah, although, although most of the actors in this film are not from the Veneto. And so if, if, you're, if you are from this the region you you can hear like my partner came in uh, he's venetian and he came in and watched a little bit of the film with me and i had said to him oh i think it apparently the the accents are a bit more like padua than treviso but i can't really tell and he said they're not either it's, you know there's this sort of it's a very generic Veneto kind of it's like talking a bit like that and <laughs> the Birmingham of of Italy. This is an idea, and and there are some little expressions, yeah, like you said, that are very much part of this uh, northeastern area. Yeah, it's funny. But, uh, yeah, that's quite unusual. I think that that Jeremy decided to go though on this sort of journey that takes you from Sicily in his films. Uh, all the way up to the northeast, so he's he puts himself out of his comfort zone, definitely, um, which I really like. And and Treviso is just such a perfect place for this film. Yeah, there's a couple of bits where I thought, oh, that's where I catch the train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, had a coffee there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, oh, that's behind the Duomo. That's behind the cathedral. Also, I think maybe something that has not sort of helped his reputation perhaps is the fact that the sex comedy in Italy has become a kind of 
kind of degraded as a genre as you've got sort of cinema panatone and you've you've had lots of sort of uh you know all star cast sex comedies which which usually come out around about christmas time hence sort of cinema panatone which is a christmas gay comedy uh cinema sorry and uh yeah i just wonder if that sort of means that as a genre it's it's sort of no longer seen it's sort of relegated to afternoon television really I think that's true maybe of those later films that he made in the 60s. But uh, if you look at his earlier work, like those Sicilian films, they're not sex comedies at all. And the, the spaghetti Western, which quite possibly, and some people say is like the first Italian Western. It reminded me of, what's that, Gregory? Is it the big country where the Gregory Peck? Okay, so... The, the magistrate who goes from Palermo to this tiny backwater town in Sicily to go and work as the local magistrate, he's a bit like a Gregory, he's like the Gregory Peck character in, in the big country, arriving with his like modern newfangled ways. Um, but it's also one of the first films that really talked about the mafia. And that would be a really interesting film to talk about just in its own right. And if you look at other works of his, um, there's one called Il Camino della Speranza, which I think has a literal translation in English, like the path to hope or the path of hope, where he he talks about people trafficking. It's really interesting. And again, it's not a sex comedy at all. It's about men who worked in a sulfur mine and they have to leave their pokey little village in Sicily and they and their aim is to go and start a new life in France and so he's made really interesting films and quite revolutionary kind of topics I think as well so he's not so he some of his films have aged really well in, in that respect you know we still look at us we're still making mafia films we're still talking about that we're still making films of course we're making films about people trafficking and uh the exploitation of uh of people who are trying to start a new life in a new country and he was doing that in like 1949 and so i think he i think he definitely merits um a little bit of a retrospective. Camino della Speranza is Path of Hope, and in the name of the law was the year before that is the the Western you were talking about. Both of which were were the Fellini uh, co-scripted for forty nine and fifty. You know, before he he's doing this this trilogy of the more of the of the sex comedies, the divorce Italian style, Seduced and Abandoned, and this film. Yeah, although I mean, Seduced and Abandoned's not a comedy. It's a lot more serious than than the than the two. It's kind of sandwiched between two comedies, but it's it's definitely the more serious and more dramatic of the three. I mean, I haven't I haven't seen a lot of the, uh, other films of his. Those are kind of that's about the ones I've talked about. Are the only ones I really know. I don't know much uh, about any of the other ones. But he, there was a film, his last film, Alfredo Alfredo. I discovered um, is with Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, yeah, 1972. Yeah, Stefania, Stefania Sandrelli, who was uh, often used as his sort of ingenue character in uh, those uh, sex comedies. Yeah, I have no idea what it's like. I've never heard of it until I looked him up the other day. Yeah, and that's really early in Dustin Hoffman's career as well. I mean, he's... Yeah, uh, 72. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's in the first flush of it, let's say. Quite quite a catch. Yeah, but, but there are a lot of those really great directors like Jeremy and Fellini and uh the seeker and so on they're all kind of like interrelated and then when you watch their films you'll find actors that are in the you know in the same film so people like uh the incredibly handsome oh god what was his name the footballer he's a footballer Raph. he's not in he's not in our film he's in a different film he was in riso amaro um and he's also in The Path of Hope, and he's called uh, Raph Vallone. And he's a really interesting character. He looks like Burt Lancaster. Um, but you find that there are all these sort of stories that are, they're all part of the same history of that brilliant period of Italian filmmaking. 
Yeah, it's it's amazing how many of these films, you know, Marcello Mastroianni turns up in or Car- Claudia Cardinale is in in a, a few of his films and yeah, you're you're just like wow, they had such a there's such an explosion of talent in the 50s and 60s in Italy. It's it's uh it's unbelievable. And also not only in cinema, also in literature and in music, you know, and popular music. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And actually, Pietro Germi made a couple of films uh, that I don't know and I haven't seen, but with Celentano, with Adriano Celentano, and I think with, who's the other guy, Gianni Morandi. Right, yeah, both huge pop stars of their day. No idea what these films are like. I imagine they're a bit, I don't know if they're like Cliff Richard, Cliff Richard films or, I have no idea. Well, I think Celentano made, because Celentano made a bunch of films with old Nella Muti as his co-star yeah. as well. And I think they were, I think they were a little bit more, he took, he certainly took them more seriously. Or there was more sort of an idea of. Yeah, he was very much an actor uh, and, and not someone like Elvis who, you know, had to sort of just sing in a bunch of films. But yeah, I think Adriano Celentano very much was just like, it kept those two kind of, Two jobs separate. And of course, Chilantano sh- uh, shows up in uh, La Dolce Vita doing his sort of like nonsense American singing to, to rock and roll. And it's like, oh, I have okay. to say, yeah. um, Kalim spoke about La Dolce Vita on your show, Kalim Aftab. And I thought that was really brave of him because when I thought about choosing a film, I immediately went to the Bicycle Thieves. I was like, oh, I'll do the Bicycle Thieves because it's my favorite. Such a lovely film. And how could you not talk about it? And then I thought, oh, I'll probably spend like half of the time crying. Oh, the poor little boy in a bicycle. And so I thought, I'll choose something else. Um, but that Dolce Vita is, is a good one. Uh, is a really great film to choose because you've got to really, yeah. Everybody knows La Dolce Vita or thinks they know La Dolce Vita to an extent, or we all know images of it for sure. Um, and actually, I have got a good Fellini story that a friend of mine who lives in Venice is from Rome, and he is a bit older than us. He's like in his 60s, and he grew up very near Cinecitta, and he lived like lots of uh, Italians, like with the extended family, and so he lived with his granny. And when Fellini was making a, a film, he would say to one of his crew, oh, go and knock on uh, Mrs. What's Her Face's door and see if she's free. Because uh, she was like the perfect archetypal kind of old grandma. And so they would just kind of go in and say, oh, hello, Mr. Fellini was wondering if you were free today. And she would go over and like appear in some of his films. And and my friend also appeared in a couple of sort of dodgy kind of Bud Spencer westerns that were intuitive that. Yeah. Oh my God, that's amazing! What an amazing just the uh, uh, the the way of the ad hoc way of casting someone, as right? Like, but, but she just looked the part, you know. Um, how Philly, you know, they're so perfect, all of those extras, and he hand picked all of them. And uh, and my friend's granny was one of the one of the stars. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. I mean, that's what makes uh, La Dolce Vita. That's one of the many, 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 many things which makes La Dolce Vita so good is that. You know the people sitting in the two two tables back in the cafe are dressed as interestingly and look as interesting as the people who you're following. So you know every frame will have someone wearing sunglasses that you think, "Wow, I want I want to know about them." Yeah, well, Jeremy, I think is also great at that, and and particularly, but well, in our film in Signore Signori, what's amazing is the women are absolutely gorgeous. Even the ones that aren't that gorgeous are still way better looking than the men. There are almost, there's almost not, I don't think there are any attractive men in that film, are there? Maybe Tony. Osvaldo when he falls in love, because when he doesn't fall in love, he's sort of a big, Potato head is a bit lump, and then he's got, and then he goes and has a. And then he goes a, a and gets his cut. beard cut and he goes, "That's it," because he wants to look young and dashing. So he goes to the barber and says, "Oh, that's it. Off with the beard and moustache." And then he looks at himself in the mirror, covers his face, the lower part of his face, and goes, "Wait, just the beard." And then he gets a brilliant haircut. 
gets the fast car. There's a great scene when he picks up his beautiful young lover uh, in his new sports car. And then she's worried because she's just been fired from her job and she's a bit upset. And he goes, oh, are you crying? And she's like, no, it's raining. And he doesn't know how to put the, the roof on his car. And it's just, you, you just know it's going to end in disaster. Yeah, absolutely. And his, I mean, his situation, I think he's typified in a very uh, amusing way at the beginning when he sort of takes out, uh, and you think it's going to be like a box of little sweets or something. He takes out a little box and it's got loads of little folding bits and it's two earplugs to stick in his ears. And it, and, the, and the sound goes out of the film. Yeah, another sort of... That is used to such brilliant effect twice in that film. I just absolutely love the earplugs. Yeah, I, yeah, he, he's it's an it's a brilliant film, and I think um, this will not be the last Jeremy film that we will be looking. I at. really hope not. I mean, I I would love it if somebody obviously uh, it would be great if someone chose something like Divorzio Italiana, but I I think In Nome della Legge as as a fantastic Italian western would make a great topic of conversation, and and he has brilliant brilliant. Um, non-professional actors in there, and the, and the young men in the film uh, in Il Camino della Speranza in Path of Hope, they all look like they're related in a good way to a young Marlon Brando. All these miners in the sulfur mine, you're like, oh my god, hello! It's like a Dolce and Gabbana advert for an aftershave. They're gorgeous, and then you see a lot of the other actors who are older and they're probably not even that much older and they're you know they've got like a random selection of teeth still in their mouths and they just look so old and weathered by their hard lives and he depicts them beautifully so i really hope somebody chooses another jeremy film yeah well yeah you hear that folks i've thrown down my gauntlet Exactly. The gauntlet has been thrown down and it will be picked up. It will be seized. I hope so. Because he's a great, I think he's a great topic of conversation for sure. Yeah. And and there to be to be sort of rediscovered and, and put on your letterboxed watch list. Yeah. And a lot of them are available on YouTube. Um, so for, for, I don't know, for speakers though, who don't speak Italian, um, I'm not sure if they're all subtitled. That's the only thing. Um, and although I did say that he'd been sort of sidelined a bit. He has had quite a few films restored. One of them was actually, one of them was chosen as a Cannes classic and I think they restored it, but I can't remember which one. Only a few years ago, actually, 2021, I think. But I can't remember. It might have been, it, it might have been. Because I think it was, I think it was this one because it won the... Ah, the, um... uh, because it won the Grand Prix. Because I don't think they had the Palme d'Or at the time. Listen, thanks so much, Joanne, for suggesting this film. It was it was a first for me. That's so I loved sort of meeting Pietro in this in in this way. And uh it's not gonna be the last film I watch by him. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. Ciao.